So very happy to be here and talking about my last paper or in general research agenda on low interest rate internet and um, big spending. So this is a joint work with Amir Karmani, who is at US Berkeley, and Rodney, who is a senior economist at the Fed Board. So let me start with this, what is the main question? The main question is, well, a major question at the Fed, as well as other policy makers or Federal Reserve central banks in the world are facing is how effective was unconventional monetary policy after the crisis? The reason being that uh, they put really a lot of effort in lowering interest rates, but still we saw six years after the crisis, uh, households that were very high level of debt, a really high level of unemployment, slow recovery. Okay. So there are doubts that these actually work. And in particular, let me show what was the effort. So this is uh, an exhibit that shows you the balance sheet of different central banks all over the world in 2007 up to the second quarter 2013. So basically what you see, the first thing is that it really jumps up. So it goes from 2007 to 2013, increases by $4.7 trillion. Okay. And then if you decompose these across different central banks, basically what you can see is that the US one, the Fed, increased the most. So in particular it goes from 0 0.9 to just doubling it 2.2 in 2008, and then reaches $3.5 trillion in 2013. Okay. So it seems that they really trying to decrease, increase liquidity in the market, reduce interest rates. But now, does it matter or not? And in particular, this is a big deal because what happened in May and June 2013? So who knows? What happened in May 2013? So there was basically a big conference with Bernanke announcing that they were stepping out of the QE, okay? So basically they were trying to normalize the situation and uh, taking out the tempering, okay? Taking out of uh, stopping things, uh, liqu liquid injection in the market. Okay? What happened afterwards? Panic everywhere, okay? So this is, for example, in September of the same year, this is the G20 leaders, uh, and they're wondering about the ripple effects and the risk for financial markets all over the world. And then you lower the world, especially in emerging markets. So for example, this is a deputy finance minister in China, and he says, we hope that the issuing country of the largest uh, currency reserves uh, will be mindful of the spillover of their macroeconomic policy. The same happened all over the place. So for example, this is Brazil. And they say, well, they should have called us before doing this, because a lack of coordination exit from exceptionally loose monetary policies might have huge effect everywhere. This is Rajan, who is the governor of Bank of India, and he said basically the same. He said international monetary cooperation is broken down. So it seemed that at least it was perceived as a big deal. Okay? That unconventional monetary policy was, a u in terms of economic uh, expansion, fiscal stimulus was huge, and then was considered even more important when it was taken out. And then, with these, uh, just two years afterwards, with these uh, uh, aplomb, Draghi came and said, oh, Maybe exactly when the, the Fed is taking out all of these measures, this is the time in which we, stop, we should step in. And it announces one trillion dollars, one trillion euro of quantitative easing. Okay. And this seems to have had an effect on financial markets. At least governments can borrow at lower interest rates. So these are 10 year government bonds for good countries like Germany and US, and let's say peripheral countries like Spain and Italy. Okay. As you can see, I mean, for example, Italy really now can borrow in January 2015 at a much, much lower rate than it was in uh, just 2013. Okay, and if you expand this up to 2008, it's even better. So at least they had an effect on government. But do we really care about this effect or should we think about this as, or at least think about the quantitative easing as helping the economy to recover after the crisis? Well, reasonable people will disagree, which is you know, what I always tell my students, and also economists are exactly the same type of people. So some economists think quantitative easing was extremely good because now consumption can go up. Why? Because if I am a household that had a very high uh, mortgage, I can refinance a lower interest rate. This means that my monthly payment goes down, I can use this money somewhere else. And this will boost the economy. However, there are other economists that say, look, these are all of these is just wishful thinking. Why? Because we are injecting liquidity, but the banks don't lend. So if you're an household that you want to refinance, you're not gonna be able to do that. You're not gonna be able to get a new mortgage. So all of these, the only ones that are gonna experience a benefit 
are going to be banks, uh, large corporations that can borrow a very low interest rate, and maybe governments. And just to give you an example of the differences, for example, this is Olivier Branchard, who is the chief economist at the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and he say one should not expect too much from further quantitative easing or credit easing. It should be done, but the implications for the economy will be limited. Okay. And then there is another reasonable or unreasonable guy that says the reason most of us uh, uh, favor QE, well, no, it's not because me or Janet Yellen are on the, secretly on Goldman Sachs uh, payroll, and we don't believe that conventional monetary policy can do miracles, but still we think that the Fed is the only game in town, and we should actually put an effort in understanding what's going on. Okay. This is Paul Krugman in the New York Times. So what do we do? So we take this seriously. So it's the first time that I quote Krugman, by the way. And uh, I, we say, OK, we really want to understand what's going on with this low interest rate. Who we'll take advantage of this. And we look particularly at the micro evidence. And you, know, you, can, f you can start thinking about uh, small companies. But small companies, both in the US and Europe, and even larger companies uh, in Spain and Italy, didn't really have access to credit. So, well, maybe this channel doesn't work. But the additional channel is what I was pro proposing before. The possibility of low, ultra low interest rate by benefit household and by increased consumption that way. And so this is basically what we investigate. However, there is a problem. So who are the households that are willing or able to refinance their mortgage or getting a new mortgage? Well, all you have a very good credit history, you need to have it, because otherwise the bank is not going to lend to you, especially after the crisis. It's not gonna, you are not going to be able to refinance your mortgage. And you, do not, you don't have any liquidity constraint, because to refinance your mortgage, you need to put down cash. Okay? What is the problem? Is that if I have a lot of this, I have cash and I have a good credit history, these are going to allow me to refinance my mortgage, but it's also going to drive all my consumption and saving decisions. So you're going to see this correlation between these two things, refinancing and consumption, but this is not driven by the fact that the interest rates are low, just driven because you are a very good household with a very good credit history, and you are able to do that. The same you can say for geographical variation. So if I am in Las Vegas, this is a very different behavior. I'm going to assume a very different behavior than if I live in New York, because Las Vegas was hit very severely by the housing crash. So my loan to value ratio is going to be very high, I'm not going to be able to refinance my mortgage. But that's not really the channel we want to measure. Because if I am in Vegas, probably it's the economy that's crappy there. While like, if you compare it with New York, it's going to be completely different. Okay. So how we make progress here? We make progress by looking at uh, a, I call it the big brother data set. So we observe all the mortgages originated in the US and all your Equifax credit bureau reports. Okay. And we look at a particular type of households, the ones that during 2005 and 2007 got an adjustable rate mortgage. And the nice thing was this mortgage was interest only for 10 years. And after, 10 e after five years, it was an automatic reset. So suppose that you got a mortgage in 2005, you only pay the interest rates for five years, no matter what the interest rates are, no matter what the housing market is doing. Then after five years, you reset automatically. Okay? So the challenges that I showed you before here don't apply because this is really a feature of the contract. It doesn't really matter if you have 750 or 650 as credit score. It doesn't really matter where you live, so it's not endogenous. Okay. And the good thing is that also this shock seems to be very big. So if you look at a household that got a mortgage in 2005 and one that was able to refinance in 2010, the difference in the interest rate is, among, is above 3%. So this seems to be a big shock. Let me show you what we do. So this is the LIBOR, exactly, and this is from March, for example, 2005, up to uh, November 2013. Okay. Why the LIBOR? Because all of these adjustable rate mortgages, 85%, are indexed by, to the LIBOR. So we look at one random muscle, and this poor guy got a mortgage in March 2005. Okay. And he got this particular type of mortgage. It was interest only, was fixed. So as you can see, the LIBOR goes up, goes down, but this is his payment, it's gonna stay flat. And then in March 2010, exactly five years afterwards, he resets. And he resets a much lower rate. Okay. 
we're going to compare this guy with a very similar guy who has exactly the same type of mortgage, but he got the mortgage a few months later. So he got, for example, the mortgage at the end of 2005, which means that he's going to reset at the end of 2010, and we're going to compare the behavior of these two guys. So these two households have exactly the same type of mortgage, live exactly the same place, exactly the same uh, type of house. The only difference is that randomly, one guy got the mortgage in January, one got it in March, and so this means that uh, if I got it in January, I'm going to have the reset early, which means that I'm going to get some money out of this reset, and I can use it to spend it. And how much my consumption goes up relative to the other guy. And let me show you what do we find. First of all, the shock is huge. So on average, households with this type of mortgages were paying uh, 1,900 uh, as monthly payment. After the reset, they were paying 900 less. So it's basically a reduction of about 50%. $900 less per month. So think about this over a longer horizon of three, four years. These are thousands and thousands of dollars uh, as a fiscal stimulus. Then the question is, what do we do with this money? So a part of it, which is a quite a big chunk, is used as a consumption. So going back to the question that I had at the beginning, you know, the Fed is really lowering interest rate, is putting liquidity in the market. The ones that could actually take advantage of this are spending. And how much are spending? They're spending more than usual between 150 and 400 dollars per month more, which is an increase of 40 percent. So it's a huge effect. However, how much do I, on one end I consume, I consume more, what do I do next? Well, I also try to deliver. So I had a very high mortgage, very high debt. I try to use some of this extra money to repay my mortgage faster. How much faster? Usually, I double. So we observe if you got a mortgage of $100,000, you were paying 700 monthly payment, now you can pay much less, but you still keep paying more than what you should, just because you want to take out this mortgage as fast as possible. And then one interesting thing is, who are the guys that spend the most? Who are the ones that consume? They consume, who are the ones that deliver the most? So the interesting thing is that the low, low income households are the ones that consume the most, and almost always don't use these to deliver. Who are the ones that deliver the most? Are the ones that have a loan to value ratio very close to 80, 90%. And this makes a lot of sense because this means that you are very close to build equity in your house. And so you can use this extra money to pay off a part of this mortgage, build equity in the house, and maybe refinance next. Okay? So what are our measure of consumption? So our measure of consumption, we use exactly the credit reports data. And what do we observe there? We observe your auto loans. And by the way, 85% of the cars in the US are sold as leasing or as auto loans. So we basically cover the whole market. And so this is durable consumption. But then we also observe your credit cards. And we observe the credit cards if it's a store credit card, your Best Buy, Macy's card, or also if it's done by Chase or Bank of America. Okay. What are the measure of the leveraging? One example that I showed you is that I start repaying faster the mortgage. I start repaying faster also my student debt, or my credit card bill, or my home equity line of credit, for example. Okay, so we can show all of this. Obviously, we don't observe all the spending going on, because we don't observe anything that happens with cash, checks, or if I put this money in my savings account. But still, I think this provides some evidence that something important was going on. And let me show you some graphs. So this is really an event study. So these are number of quarters before and after the interest reset. So the one that I showed you before in the interest rate, and then it jumps down. So time zero is when your interest rate gets reset. And uh, on the y-axis is the monthly payments. As you can see, I normalize it these in the pre-period equal to zero. They stay flat. You always pay the same. And then once the shock occurs, it goes down. How much it goes down? I told you basically about minus $100. Let's look at car sales, for example. So consumption. There is basically nothing going on before that, which means I wasn't like, expecting or I wasn't using this money before they were on my bank account. And then once the mortgage resets, I start spending. Okay? And it stays up until 
as you can see, basically seven quarters after. So for a couple of years after the reset, I still spend more than what I should, or what I was doing before. How much delivered? As you can see here, it's very clear. I was using uh, very little. So I was barely making the payments. And now after the reset, I'm using a lot of it to repay my mortgage fast. What I told you is that basically these are also heterogeneous across households. And this is important because, you know, one, and I'm going to come back now when I conclude, is one important channel of monetary policy is also how this affects inequality. Okay? So understanding what are really the type of households that benefit the most also tells us something about the general distributional consequences of monetary policy. As I said, basically, the high LTV guys, very high loan-to-value ratio, spend uh, more than twice as much as the lower loan-to-value ratio. I have 120% loan-to-value ratio. I have really no incentive to build equity in my house. If I have this extra cash, I'm going to use it to spend it. If I am a low-income guy, well, here I really have a very high marginal propensity to consume. For me, an extra dollar is extremely important, and of that extra dollar, I'm going to spend all of it. Then you can say, well, all of this is all at the individual level. Maybe in the aggregate, when you look at the macro, all of this washes out. Because there are going to be some that are going to use this money, some are not. Maybe this has no aggregate consequences. So we take the, you know, our idea a little bit more seriously and say, OK, if our mechanism of how important monetary policy is, is the fact that if you have an adjustable rate mortgage, you are able to refine. It is sort of refinancing your mortgage. Well, then let's look at the map of the US. And let's compute for each county the fraction of adjustable rate mortgages. Okay. You can see it's not random. So it's very concentrated. Darker means that higher fraction. It's very concentrated in the West Coast and the East Coast. The reason being that if I use an adjustable rate mortgage, it's usually because I want to buy larger houses. So it's very correlated with house prices. Okay. However, let's fix this. And let's see now when the interest rate changes, how different counties react. And we can measure exactly the same thing that I showed you before, consumption, the leveraging, at the county level. And the interesting thing is that we find a huge aggregate effect in the sense that a reduction of the interest rate through, for example, quantitative easing leads to a reduction of uh, the interest rates that are paid on average in those counties, especially those with a higher fraction of arms. Does it matter for st stimulus? Yes, it does. In particular, the ones with a higher fraction of arms are also the ones that experience a higher increase in car sales, uh, increase in card credit card balances, and they're also the ones that decline the mortgage balances. So you deleverage the most. Now, so what I think is really the contribution is that a lot of the macro literature thinks about this idea of wage rigidities. So firms don't really change wages, and are, these are very sticky. Here I'm showing you a completely different channel, which is debt rigidity. So the problem of how important monetary policy is, is shaped by how important frictions in the mortgage market are. And not the fact that the banks don't lend, but the fact that if I lent before with a fixed contract, and now I'm not able to change it because it's rigid, then the households are not going to benefit from it. So this helps also understanding uh, the distribution of consequences of monetary policy. And people have argued that monetary policy has increased inequality. <coughs> Why? Because after the crisis, uh, equity prices have doubled. And if you look at the distribution of financial wealth, financi financial wealth is distributed uh, very s in a very skewed way. So all the top guys have a lot in the financial market, while they have very little in housing. And since housing has not recovered after the crisis, the guys that had a lot of their wealth in, in the financial markets recovered very fast, because basically equity prices increased immediately, just basically in two years. Well, since the housing price is, is lagging and the middle class, it has almost all of its financial wealth in housing, they are not recovering. Okay. And in particular, for example, you can see this picture that shows how inequality has changed over time. This is the bottom 50% of the population. This is the next 45%. This is the top 5%. You can see there is a trend that has increased over time starting at 45% in the 80s, at the late 80s, and now it's more than 65%. But you do observe basically that in the last few years, this has increased even more. 
So our final message is the idea that if you actually want to make monetary policy and the lowering of interest rate work, you should allow these households or should have policies that target households in a way that allow them to refinance their mortgage faster. Because that's the only way in which everybody can actually take advantage of it. Thank you so much, guys.